Morning all. All right, starting a little later than, than usual. I don't have to do a preview this morning because we don't have games. And I want to talk about Seattle. So I put this board together uh, and I'm I'm quite happy with how all this has turned out. Uh, I want to talk about the Seattle Kraken in that they have reached the playoffs in their second season. And it, it is something that I think we take for granted a little bit because of the Vegas effect, right? Well, Vegas got in their first, uh, first couple of years, so it doesn't get as much attention. Also, the fact that Seattle plays in what's perceived as the weakest division is going to cause it to get a lot less attention than it might get if they played in the East or in the Metro. But if Seattle was in the Metro, man, the travel schedule. So <clears throat> early on, basically day one, when the picks leaked out of who Seattle was taking, right? Remember the picks leaked out and we all kind of looked at the list and went, well, that's interesting. And I remember there was a lot of criticism that they didn't take Tarasenko, right? And a lot of criticism, they didn't take Carey Price. The question of, well, why aren't they taking Carey Price? And I remember uh, the the mental gymnastics that were being done, too, by people who were saying, well, you know, Carey Price isn't actually hurt. Montreal's making it sound like he's hurt. That way Seattle won't take him. And then they don't have to worry about the fact they didn't protect him. And all of that 4D chess turned out to be incorrect. He was hurt. Uh, Seattle doesn't take him, and they made the right decision not taking him. Uh, now, of the players that they took, the ones that are still part of the organization, and I went by alphabetical order of the teams they were taken from, Will Borgen, good, solid, depth defenseman, was in a fight last night against Arizona. Morgan Geeky, depth forward, who I thought might have a chance to really score in Seattle. He hasn't, but that's okay, because they have a lot of other scorers, and we will get to that part of the story as well. Jamie Alexiak, solid top four defenseman. Honestly, I liked their blue line a lot coming out of the expansion draft. And even though year one wasn't great, I thought their blue line was a strength. Uh, Adam Larson being part of that as well, obviously. Uh, both Alexiak and Larson signing extensions. I remember too, before the expansion draft, people saying, well, they're not going to take anybody who's on an expiring contract. That'd be stupid because that player could just become a UFA a few days later. So they're not going to take anybody on an expiring contract. And they did, and they signed him. Uh, then you have Chris Drieger. Now, Drieger, of course, uh, got hurt, uh, and he's he hasn't played in the National Hockey League this year. Uh, it's been tough for him. I hope he's healthy and able to come back next season. Uh, it turns out that getting Martin Jones in there as the backup this year was the right move, in part because, uh, yeah, Drieger, it, it was a long way back for him. Then there's Carson Soucy, who's added from Minnesota. Uh, Soucy, there were rumors at the deadline that he was going to get moved because he's on an expiring contract. But why would you do that? If you're in a playoff spot, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, if they were outside the playoffs, sure. But in a playoff spot, it doesn't make any sense to move a defenseman as a rental somewhere else when you're going to need a rental defenseman in exchange, right? You would you would need to pick up another defenseman. So it wouldn't have made any sense. Uh, basically, they have their own rental. Uh, Jordan Eberle has had quite the turnaround in Seattle. Now, in terms of his offense, it is it is somewhat inconsistent, but still, the overall numbers have been quite good for him. So while, yeah, he goes through his cold streaks, it's fine. Seattle uh, has a lot of guys who can score goals. Uh, Joey Decord, good number three goaltender. Uh, I don't think there's been any complaints about him as a number three. I mean, he's not a starter or a backup. Uh, Brandon Tanev, absolutely fantastic pickup. Really hurt the Penguins when they lost Tanev. Uh, I think that that third line for Pittsburgh being basically gone during that summer uh, has caused them to have some struggles since then. And Vince Dunn. And I defended the pick of Vince Dunn ahead of Vlad Tarasenko at the time. And I'm still defending it now. Vince Dunn. Absolutely fantastic defenseman, not getting nearly enough consideration for the Norris because all anybody cares about is points when it comes to the Norris this year. It is baffling uh, because, again, and I said this said this last night, Yossi had a fantastic year scoring-wise last year, didn't win the Norris. Um, but yeah, Yanni Gord, also on that list, uh, picked up from Tampa, another, and there are a lot of players who've left Tampa, gone on to play more prominent roles elsewhere, and they've done quite well for themselves. Uh, Taylor Radish is doing it in Chicago. JT Miller in Vancouver. Uh, they're, really, it shows the depth in the Tampa Bay organization. And Gord's been good. He hasn't been a prime go-to guy, but he doesn't have to be. Uh, Jared McCann, fantastic pickup. Of course, Toronto got him and then lost him in the expansion draft. Just imagine if they hadn't taken McCann. If Jared McCann was on that Toronto Maple Leafs team. Yeah, that would be a really strong top six if they had McCann in it. Uh, not that they don't have a strong top six, but McCann's pretty good. Uh, and then there's Cole Lind, who's still in the organization. I remember Canuck fans being kind of upset that Lind got moved. 
Uh, they, 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 the Canucks didn't find a way to hold on to him, but I remember Gadjevich, there was a lot of complaining too when the Canucks lost him. It's it's that fear that fans in certain uh, markets have that if we let, that, let this guy go, he's going to be a star somewhere else. Uh, so I also wanted to highlight a trade they made this past summer uh, in that they acquire Oliver Bjorkstrand from Columbus, who needed to shed salary. And going the other way were two draft picks they had acquired in trade. They didn't trade their own picks. A 2023 third they got from Calgary and a 2023 fourth they got from Winnipeg. That was a very astute deal. And uh, it is interesting because I think there's gonna there, there were a lot of people who might have said, well, this guy isn't a game changer and that guy's not a game changer. But when you collectively put them together, it changes the game. Now, worthy of note, on the IR, I didn't put him on the list of players who were grabbed in the expansion draft, but... Yes, Jonas Donskoy was grabbed. He's still part of the organization, but he hasn't played this season. Uh, the first year for Seattle, Donskoy was all around the net, could not get the goals. I think he had two last year, and and just I feel bad for Donskoy. I had an, I, I, honestly, I really like Donskoy quite a bit as a player, and so yeah, there's Donskoy sitting on the IR, and I, I feel bad. It's it's too bad he's not a part of this. So year one, before the the teams hit the ice yet, they go out in free agency. They signed Philip Grubauer. Now, I don't think that signing's aged particularly well. I think if they had decided to keep Vanacek, who they picked up in the expansion draft, and not sign Grubauer, they might be better off right now in net. Uh, while Vanacek has had a, a solid run with New Jersey, his numbers are better than Grubauer. So while there's... Vanacek's not a top 10 goaltender in the NHL, but he's still a good starter, and yeah, Grubauer's had his struggles. Uh, Jaden Schwartz, good pickup. And at the time, there was some some furrowed brows, and I'm not sure what they're what they're picking up here. But with with Schwartz, it's more than just the points. There's the experience level, and he's just he's a really solid all around player. I think um, I've been a Jaden Schwartz fan for for many years now. Uh, Alex Wenberg, that turned out to be a decent signing, and these were signings that were maybe a little more expensive for Seattle than they might have been for somebody else. And maybe you could look and go, well, they overspent by a million here or a million there, but. That's okay because they had all that cap space. One big difference between Seattle and Vegas, Seattle had the cap space that first year and going into that, that second summer. And then Ryan Donato. Donato was a brilliant signing, and the fact that Donato has stayed there, I, I think that was that was a really just very intelligent move with the team. So coming out of year one, it was obvious that changes need to be made. So in the summer, they go out, they get Andre Burakovsky from Colorado, who outside of when he's been injured, he's been very effective for them. Justin Schultz, solid defenseman, and really helping to build that defense up. I think they've done a very good job of creating a very good top six. And Martin Jones, who record-wise has been very good. His stats have been not great, but that's kind of the Martin Jones way when I think back to when he was in C in, in San Jose where he would have an excellent win-loss record, and then he'd look at his save percentage and go, wow, I don't know how he's there. But it's just, I don't know, teams win in front of him. I don't know if it's teams rally around Jones. Maybe he's a really popular guy, and so they, they get fired up. Maybe it's the way he plays that, that aids his team. But yeah, teams generally tend to have good records when he's in the net. Now, I also wanted to put smart acquisitions on the board, so I did. Uh, Daniel Sprong, that was a brilliant addition by the team last year. Uh, Marcus Johansson on his way out anyways, so they, they move him, Sprong comes in, and ends up re-signing in Seattle, and Sprong's been quite the revelation for them, as has Ellie Tolvanen since getting picked up from Nashville on waivers. I don't think if Tolvanen stayed in Nashville, he would have scored as well as he has in Seattle since being picked up, because I don't think he would have had the chance from John Hines uh, that he's been getting with Dave Haxtall in Seattle. But again, when you've got an expansion team in its second year, it's a more malleable lineup. Things aren't as set in stone with a team in its first or second year as you'll have with a team that's been around for decades. And you've got veterans who've been in the lineup for 10 plus years or however, you know, five plus years even. And so I, I think there's there's more room for movement. And I don't get the feeling that there's there's the ego problems in Seattle you may have in other cities as well. So if Tolvanen gets the ice time ahead of some one of the other forwards, I don't get the feeling that that's something that, you know, puts their nose out of joint. Uh, and in terms of draft picks, uh, I think they've got two hits. Now, I'm, I'm going to defend this. So Matty Beneers was drafted second overall in 2021. He is likely to win the Calder. Now, it may go to Stuart Skinner. Uh, you can also make the argument for Jake Sanderson in Ottawa. Uh, you can make an argument for Owen Power in Buffalo, too. 
Um, Power's still a rookie, right? Sure, we'll go with that. Pretty sure he is. But at any rate, uh, so yeah, Matty Beneers has been absolutely remarkable. I think that his two-way game makes him stand out. So you can look at the points and say, well, I mean, points-wise, he's very good. He's a very solid two-way forward, and he has played a large role in Seattle's improvement this year. Uh, Shane Wright drafted fourth overall last year. I'm fine with how they handled it. I'm fine with how they handled him being on the roster, and then they sent him down uh, to the OHL, I think, at the, the right time of the year. Uh, he had some games in the AHL. He got to play in the World Juniors. I think his development's going to be just fine. Now, maybe Shane Wright doesn't become the star player that he was projected to be a couple of years before his draft. But yeah, he was a number four draft pick. So he wasn't the number one. And I, I, I can't take a victory lap on a team that has improved by as much as Seattle has. Shane Wright at this point doesn't have to become a star player. He just has to be a decent top nine guy on a team that has quite the top nine. Now, unrestricted free agents this summer, there's not a ton here. You've got Donato, who they may choose to keep. Uh, Froden, Hayden, these are depth forwards, right? Uh, Jesper Froden, John Hayden, you know. Uh, and then there's Carson Soucy, Martin Jones, and Nett. Uh, if Drieger's going to be good to go for training camp, and if you think he's fully recovered, then you let Jones go. You thank him for his, his service. And then Donskoy, uh, highly, highly likely, I would think his career may very well be done. Uh, we shall find out soon enough. And then restricted free agents this summer. You got Morgan Geeky. He'll get a raise. I don't know how much. Uh, Daniel Sprong definitely gets a raise this summer. Uh, and I would think he'd want to stay in Seattle. I, I think that players, uh, when they're in a situation like this where, again, there's guys producing in Seattle that probably wouldn't be elsewhere. So it's smart. It'd be smart for Sprong to decide to stay in Seattle and smart for Seattle to keep him. Vince Dunn is going to get paid. Vince Dunn is really going to get paid this summer as a restricted free agent. It's going to be a long-term deal for Vince Dunn, and they have the cap space to make it happen. Uh, Decord, obviously bridge deal there. Borgen, probably bridge deal there. Kale Flurry and Cole Lind. So there's not really much there outside of Vince Dunn and Daniel Sprong where you can say these guys are going to get raises. Now, what makes it even more interesting is their cap space for next year, according to Cap Friendly, $20,473,334. So that's that's pretty good. Even if Dunn, let's say Dunn signs for $8 million, you've still got $12.5 million. They can go out this summer and they can get something done. And if they moved one of their higher price contracts, if they decided we're going to move on from, let's say, Wenberg, if they decide they're going to move on from Wenberg and they find a taker, could be just fine. All right, so their leading scorer is Jared McCann, leading the way. 36, 38 goals, 28 assists, 66 points in 75 games. What's interesting is we're in a, a season right now where there's so many players with 100 points and it seems like almost everybody's getting 40-plus goals. Uh, Seattle is scoring by committee. You've got Dunn with 14 goals, 50 assists, so 64 points there. Everly, 19 goals, 42 assists. Veneers, 23 goals, 33 assists. Gord, 12 goals, 34 assists. Sprong, 20 goals, 23 assists. Bjorkstrand, 19 goals, 23 assists. Burkowski, in only the 49 games that he's played, 13 goals, 26 assists there. Jaden Schwartz, 20 goals, 19 assists. Wenberg, 13 goals, 23 assists. And Taneb, 16 goals, 19 assists. And then you go further down. You've got Donato with 14 goals, 12 assists. And Tolvanen with 15 goals, 10 assists with Seattle. And altogether, 17 goals, 12 assists for 29 points, including his time in Nashville. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. That's, a, that's 14 players with 10 or more goals in Seattle. Uh, that makes it very difficult to knock them out. And, and it, it is going to be uh, interesting to see if during the playoffs, they're able to generate that kind of offense where it's everybody. You, you have three lines that can score. Now in net, this again, this is where things become a bit more of a challenge. Jones easily has the best record at 26-13-3, 880 save percentage, but it does feel like Grubauer is the one they want to get going into the playoffs. Uh, he's been playing a lot lately. His record, 16-13-4, and and his save percentage, 892. So his save percentage is a little better than where it was a couple weeks ago, but again, you want to get those numbers up. And then Decord, limited appearances for him. He's 2 one with a 903 save percentage. So obviously the comparison is going to be towards Vegas. And in terms of second years, their year's been better than Vegas. So Vegas, their first year, 51, 24, and 7 for 109 points. Year two, they dropped 16 points to 93 points with a record of 43, 32, and 7. Now on the Seattle side, they started last year with 27, 49, and 6 as their record for 60 points. 
and there was a lot of victory laps taken at their expense. A lot of, well, see, they aren't very good. They're just, they're not a good team. And we said they weren't a good team. And then this summer when they made the additions they did, and they end up pretty close to the cap, I saw comments along the lines of, uh, the NHL, this is an embarrassment. This team is terrible and they're right up against the cap. Uh, Ron Francis should be fired. This team is awful. They've got Hackstall behind the bench. I think he'll be fired by November 1st. Like I saw all of it, right? And and very, very few people were picking them to make the playoffs, which is odd because year one, there were those who picked them. I thought they'd be in the mix for the playoffs. And then this year, I didn't make that call. And then they end up going to 44, 26, and 8 at this point, which is 96 points. The season's not done yet. And they already have more points in year two than Vegas did. So this is a team that has a lot of depth. They can hurt you in various ways. Uh, five on five, they're fantastic. Uh, there's some special teams work that needs to be done. But there's no pressure on Seattle going into the playoffs either. So if Seattle ends up, and I mean, odds are they're a wild card team, right? I don't think that's locked in yet, but they're going to be a wild card team. Let's say they're up against Colorado in the first round. There's zero pressure on the Seattle Kraken. None. And there's a ton of pressure on Colorado. So while I would expect Colorado to win that series, and everybody, I, th I think most people, probably 95% of people would pick Colorado to win that series, it's possible. It's possible we'd see a huge upset in the first round. Um, I remember San Jose early in their existence. They were a tough out in the first round. Because, yeah, they were loosey-goosey. There's no pressure. And they were usually up against a team that was picked to go pretty far. I remember them upsetting Detroit. And how shocking that was. And Seattle has some some similarities to that San Jose team that just went out there, they did their work. And when a team is outworking that team that's that higher seed, yeah, the upset's possible. So looking at the difference between year one and year two, and, and expansion from San Jose through until the Minnesota Wild. Um, San Jose dropped 15 points in their second year. They went from 39 points to 24 Ottawa improved 13 points, but they made it very easy to do so. They only had 24 points their first year, and they went to 37. So there's kind of a, a, a reverse effect here. The interesting thing is that 39 points by San Jose, that was more than they were expected to get. There was a lot of expectation that that San Jose team that first year might challenge Washington for the worst team in the history of the National Hockey League. And then they did, but it was in year two, not year one. Um, I've already done videos on the truly awful season that that uh, San Jose had here. And I know I've done a horrible season of, of Ottawa's along the way, but I don't include expansion because expansion is expected to be bad. Uh, for Tampa Bay, they improved by 18 points in that second season. They went from 53 to 71. Uh, Anaheim, uh, it was it was year two was a lockout shortened season. So they went from a 423 points percentage to a 385. So they dropped. Uh, Florida dropped as well. They went from a 494 safe percentage to a 479. And there was a lot of buzz about the fact that there was an expansion team that was almost 500 in Florida's first year. And they had a lot of a lot of depth. They had a lot of guys who could who could outwork you. And there was maybe this thought that, hey, maybe Florida's going to get to a Stanley Cup. So what's interesting with this is that first two years, Tampa's better than, than Ottawa. Well, Tampa ends up winning a couple three Stanley Cups so far. Ottawa's been to a final. Anaheim and Florida, the better of the two. Definitely Florida out of the gate. Anaheim went with the younger players. Anaheim's the team's win, team that wins the Cup in 2007. Florida, of course, went to the final in 96. Nashville comes in. Uh, they improved seven points in year two. They went from 63 to 70. I was That was remarkable that they got 70 points out of that team. Go back and look at that roster. Uh, it shows you how well Barry Trotz coached that team. Uh, the Thrashers improved by 21 points in year two. Yep. The best number on the board is the Thrashers. They go from 39 to 60. So that second year, they were respectable. And there was an expectation that, hey, maybe Atlanta is going to get better here because their their expansion list was awful. So the fact they got 39 points with that team, nothing short of remarkable. Columbus, between year one and year two, they dropped 14 points. They went from 71 to 57. And Minnesota, in their second year, they improved by five points from 68 to 73. What's interesting is... Uh, San Jose, Stanley Cup Final in 2016. Uh, Ottawa, Stanley Cup Final in 2007. Tampa Bay, three Stanley Cups and a couple of finals thrown in there. Anaheim, Stanley Cup uh, finalists once, and then they win the Cup in 2007. Florida, the one Stanley Cup Final uh, in 96. Two, 2017 for Nashville. Pekka Rene is too good right now. Uh, Atlanta, and now Winnipeg, and we're still waiting for a Stanley Cup Final appearance. Columbus, 
Uh, a couple of first round wins outside of that, not much. And by a couple of first round wins, I'm, I'm including the qualifying round in that. And Minnesota. Uh, for the Minnesota Wild, they had the conference final run in 2003 and not much to speak of since then. So regular season success has been there for some of these teams, but postseason success, elusive outside of Tampa with their Cups and Anaheim with their single Cup as well. Uh, they're, again, the final appearances too, but that Stanley Cup championship everybody wants. Not a lot here. Vegas, of course, reached the Stanley Cup final in their first year. They've been conference finalists since then as well. So what's in store for Seattle? Well, I don't think we really know yet. And I wanted to do year one to year two because it kind of shows that early on doesn't tell you how well the organization is going to handle things and what the future is going to be. So yes, Vegas has that absolutely fantastic, perfect year one. And their record right now, they may end up passing that 109 points. They have 106 currently. So it's possible Vegas puts up more points this year than they did in year one. But the amount of pressure on Vegas is really high. The amount of pressure on Seattle... Not so much. Uh, I think Seattle's going to be just happy to be there. And it's interesting, too, because, again, they have more points than Vegas had in year two. But Vegas in year two is coming off of that Stanley Cup final run into year one. Seattle's coming off of a mediocre year one. So there's no expectation. But it's it's been fun to watch. It really has. This has been a great season to watch for Seattle. And I think it was early November when I said I, that I thought these guys could make the playoffs, that I, I actually believed in it. And I saw people saying, well, the schedule's going to get a lot tougher. But if you get those early points, doesn't matter how tough your schedule is. If you get those early points, you get above the playoff line, you got a chance. You have a very good chance if you're above the playoff line early in the season. And Seattle's done that. Uh, they've had some mediocre weeks and months around, uh, during this season too, but they're in the playoffs. So that's all that really matters. There you go. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below, as always. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you're browsing your way through. You just happened upon this video. Thank you guys so much for watching, for all your support. I will talk to you again soon.